Hi everyone, I'm Audrey Payne, Cherry Bomb's cookbook editor, and I'm very excited to welcome you to today's Mastering the Art of the Cookbook panel. Um, a lot of you have already done this, but before we get started, please let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. Um, I've seen a lot of people from Ireland out there, so that's very exciting. Um, or Toronto, yes. Hi everyone. Okay, so today's talk is part of the Julia Jubilee, which is our virtual celebration of the life and legacy of Julia Child. Uh, we've been celebrating Julia Child for about a week now, and we've got just one more event tomorrow after this, all about her lasting legacy. So be sure to visit our website and RSVP if you'd like to join us tomorrow. Um, before we begin today's cookbook chat, I'd like to thank all of our Julia Jubilee sponsors. So thank you to Kerrygold, Crate and Barrel, Le Creuset, Whole Foods Market, San Pellegrino and Co-Brand for helping us keep today's event and so much of our Jubilee programming this past week free. Um, today's panel, Mastering the Art of the Cookbook, is of course named for Julia's first cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. After almost a decade of research, recipe testing, rewrites and rejection, Julia's first book was released in the United States in 1961. Now a lot has changed in the world of cookbooks since then. Um, and today we're going to hear all about those changes from our panel of pros. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to say that Francis Lamb is unfortunately not able to join us this afternoon and he does apologize. Um, but it's not all bad news. Uh, today's talk will be moderated by Cherry Bomb founder and Radio Cherry Bomb host, Kerry Diamond. Uh, we'll also make sure to have time for audience questions. So if you have anything you'd like to ask our panelists, be sure to put them in the chat box below. Uh, okay, so now to welcome our panelists. First up, we have Tony Tipton Martin. Uh, Tony is a culinary journalist and author. She's the editor in chief of Cook Country Magazine and the author of Jubilee and the Jemima Code. Um, we'll also be joined by Ken Concepcion. Ken and his wife, hi Tony! <laughs> um, Ken and his wife Michelle are the duo behind now serving in LA. Uh, we've also got Matt Startwell, a former editor at Penguin and the managing partner of Kitchen Arts and Letters in New York, and Lara Hamilton, who's joining us from Seattle and the founder of Book Larder. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Carrie. Hi, everybody. Uh, Audrey, thank you so much. Um, I hope I hope folks aren't disappointed to see me and not Francis. Um, Francis, uh, again, sends his apologies that he can't join us. Um, but you can all listen to Francis on the Splendid Table and catch him uh, during the week. All right, where do we even start? I, I Francis sent me good notes. Um, the good news is I love cookbooks so much. I have been to Matt, Laura, and Ken's shops. I have Tony's books, uh, so I feel I feel fully prepared to do this. Um, before we start, uh, I lost internet for a second, and I'm not sure if we thanked our sponsors, but I do want to thank um, them for supporting our entire Julia Jubilee conference and making all of this programming free, which has been amazing. Um, Kerrygold, Crate and Barrel, Le Creuset, um, Whole Foods Market, Co-Brand, Fine Wine and Spirits, and San Pellegrino. Um, we have one event left tomorrow, and we'll be talking about the legacy of Julia Child with some amazing folks, including Tanya Holland and Jory Greenspan. So you can head over to cherrybomb.com and sign up for that. But today we are talking about cookbooks, which really is one of my absolute favorite subjects. And we're so lucky to have these people here. Um, and it, it's wonderful seeing where everyone's tuning in from. Audrey already flagged, we've got a few people from Ireland. So hello, Ireland. I guess you love cookbooks as much as we do here. Um, and then I think I saw someone in Booth Bay, Maine, all the way down to Marina Del Rey. So we really are covering the entire, the entire United States, plus some friends from Canada, as always. So I want to thank all of you. Um, I want to thank the panelists also for joining us. We're so lucky to have you together. The, the thought behind this panel was we love the cookbook sellers so much and, and we don't always get to hear from you. You know, we hear from cookbook authors all the time, um, but I just thought it would be so special to hear directly from you what people are buying these days, how you've noticed cookbooks changing. And then Tony, I'm so thrilled to have you here um, because you are a cookbook collector. You are a cookbook writer, you are an editor in chief, but you are also a passionate cookbook collector. And I know how many African-American cookbooks you have. I think you have, is it over 200 that you've collected? Oh, uh, it's over 400 now. 
Four, wow, wow. Yeah. Um, and I can't even imagine how many cookbooks you have total as the editor in chief of a food magazine. So you must have a lot of books. I do have a lot of books and I will be able to tell you more about how many there are when we start uh, unloading them for um, my set this week. <laughs> so, so the reason we wanted to, um, another reason we wanted to do this panel is because we, we did want to talk about Julia's book. Um, you know, it came out, Mastering the Art of French Cooking came out in 1961 and really had such an impact on the food world and on the cookbook world. Um, I know not all of you were running cookbook stores when uh, this book came out, but it's amazing to me when we started talking about doing um, the Julia Jubilee, I, I quickly looked at some of the cookbook rankings to see how Mastering the Art of French Cooking sells still, and it's remarkable that it is still a bestseller all these years later. And I just wanted to talk before we jump in about you know contemporary cookbooks, I just wanted to hear from, from Laura, Ken and Matt why why does this book still sell why does this you know all these years later uh, laura let's do you want to i'll start with you laura well for one thing i think the fact that she updated it with the 40th anniversary edition has kept it relevant mm -hmm. um so she added in um sort of food processor and lots of descriptive photos but also it is one of those books that, um, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. It mm -hmm. sort of gives you permission to become an expert in your own kitchen. It gives you um, sort of a really strong foundation in terms of thinking about how you buy ingredients, how you use the tools in your kitchen. Um, and her voice, I think while it is very um, sort of scholarly or academic almost in terms of the way that she sort of approaches it, mm -hmm. you get just this incredible, reliable set of, of recipes. Um, and so I think there's also just a lot of nostalgia around Julia herself. And, um, you know, people have, whether it's, you know, from having seen bits of her show, or um, maybe they've seen the movie Julia and Julia, or, you know, their grandmother or their mother, or they themselves cooked from the book. Um, it's one that people also, you know, like to give to others because they loved it. Hmm. Ken, are people buying the book in Los Angeles? Yeah, you know, it, it continues to sell. Um, and I think it's because it's, it's, it's iconic at this point. And um, it is, you know, with all the, the new books that continue to come in every season, every two, every, every year, it's like, it's kind of like the North Star of, uh, you know the, the the French category and just for cookbooks in general, I think, and it's and it's an iconic book, um, not just not just a cookbook, but it's it's like an iconic American title. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Matt, uh, I heard that you recently came upon a first edition. Yes, this is um, this is one of the true first printings with. Um, the thing to keep in mind if you're going through your mother's cabinet and you open up a copy and it says first edition, uh, Knopf called everything a first edition up until the time that Julia revised the book. So oh, wow. you have to look for other details to be sure that you've actually got a first printing. And that's what this is. There's a, a short note from the author at the back that has a date at the end of August. And you oh. want the ones that say August, later copies, later printing said October. So that's the, the diagnostic you can use if you do come across a copy, but they're, they're scarce, they're collectible, but I think any copy you end up with in your house is gonna be a great thing to own. Okay, um, Matt, that copy is for sale, right? <laughs> uh, it's actually on offer to somebody right now. So uh -oh. we're waiting to hear back. <laughs> All right, well, maybe you'll find another one, Matt. Um, Tony, you know, sometimes it's, it, Julia had such an impact on the cookbook world, on the food world in general. It's sometimes easy to think that maybe cookbooks started with Julia Child back in 1961, but in your collection, you have books that go back to, I had to take notes, was it 1827? Yep, the oldest book in my collection goes back to 1827. Wow. And, um, you know, the, the, I think if I could just answer that previous question, mm -hmm. um, I had the blessing of meeting Julia when I was an up and coming writer um, in LA and I was about 21 or something like that. 
And um, what struck me then that um, resonates today is that um, her passion comes through, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, her integrity um, and her love of good food and, and the classics, um, I think that's what makes her work so timeless. Mm-hmm. Um, and it certainly was what was inspirational to me in the pursuit of um, cookbooks, of becoming a cookbook writer. Um, th- there was just a really incredible role model to see at such an early impressionable time. Wow, um, it's amazing that you got to meet her. Yeah, it was pretty, co- pretty cool. And, and what was fun about that was I was um, attending a nutrition conference mm-hmm. and um, we were in Santa Barbara was the very first time I had attended anything like that as a young um, weekly writer trying to find my way. And uh, she'd been hovering in the background and not saying anything, right? But in her, in her classic way, she um, challenged the status quo. And she stood up and said, isn't anyone going to say that food tastes good you know, <laughs> at a nutrition conference? And, and that stuck with me. You know, she was able to, um, uh, used her knowledge and her expertise as a way to challenge all of us to do better, to cook better, um, you know, to, to find our own way in the kitchen. And um, so it's, she certainly has had that staying power for me. Wow. Wow. Um, so let's go back to the, so the oldest book in your collection, this is of the, the Black cookbooks that you have collected. 1827 is the oldest in your collection? Yes, yes. So um, it, it was written um, as a um, household management um, book. And for a long time, it was not respected as a cookbook, because while there are recipes contained in the book, there are instructions for household management, like how to get bugs, you know, off of your glassware and how to um, clean the fireplace tools. Um, but there are a few recipes embedded within this book. And what was the most compelling to me was, again, circling back to Julia and uh, integrity and messaging and agency all tied up in a cookbook. Um, this author was really writing as a love letter to the next generation of servants. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, even though he was instructed to create more servants, and historically we have gotten ourselves Um, distracted by that, by the fact that Black people were limited to um, work in the service industry, we have neglected to look at the positives that were embedded in that work. And what he did was teach the next generation um, about um, having an incredible work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so there are all kinds of little anecdotes throughout this book about how to be a good servant, how to be disciplined, um, time management, all kinds of values that still, as we're talking about resonating you know, today and in, in a book being timeless, this book from 1827 certainly is that, um, but, but it's been lost in the negativity um, associated with service enslavement um, and the marginalization of African-Americans in the food world. Mm-hmm. Tony, when did you start collecting these books? Um, I've collected them off and on from the time that I was at the LA Times in the 80s okay. as this young woman trying to find my way. Um, it became evident to me that um, white women in particular um, were able to find agency using cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Um, They could find their voice, they could identify their tribe, they could um, establish um, identity for their community. Mm -hmm. And nowhere that I looked did I see that representation for Mm -hmm. African-Americans. But I wasn't exactly sure what to do about that as a young writer. Um, And so I went on about my life and continued to just try to push my way into the food industry, which wasn't always easy. being the only black food editor or black food writer at the time that wasn't working for a black periodical. So of course there was expectation that Ebony and Essence Magazine would have black writers, but in the mainstream, I was the only one. Um, And so cookbooks, collecting them became a way for me to find voices that represented my own experience. And for a long time, all I could find was soul food books. And so that actually contributed to my feelings of insecurity in this white mainstream world, because then everything I saw that was published um, was about a food that I didn't uh, grow up 
uh, having every day. Yeah. And so no matter where I looked, I just continually felt um, excluded from the industry and left out um, of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and cookbooks actually were the place that I was able to find some comfort. So for folks who don't have um, Tony's book, The Jemima Code, so it's The Jemima Code, Two Centuries of African-American Cookbooks, Tony put together this, this incredible book that, that is really just a beautiful trip through your cookbook collection. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this book came to be? Sure. Um, you know, one of, we're talking about Julia here, so I'll try to make sure I can stay connected there. And um, one of the first pieces of advice that I got from the industry um, came from an academic, because this is the kind of content that would have existed primarily in, in the academy, right? Scholars did this kind of food study um, and excavation, and it really wasn't happening in cookbooks. We weren't seeing a lot of historical data and information being conveyed. It was mostly about the recipe and how to be a better cook. Um, but what I, this, so this advice that I got was to make sure that as I described each one of these books in my collection, that I make them identical. Mm -hmm. Right, so that if you're writing in um, a scholarly way, everything is footnoted, everything is cited and accurate and identical. And that was so contrary to the mission of the story, which was to unsaddle African American women from the image that had been, um, you know, we had been labeled with this identity of the mammy and the plantation house cook. And that it isn't that those identities weren't true, it's just that they weren't the totality of who we are and who my ancestors were. So I used cookbooks, I started collecting the cookbooks looking for identities of other women. How else did women portray themselves in cookbooks? And what I discovered in writing, assembling them for the Jemima Code is um, that they fit into very neat categories. Um, you know, the book goes from the enslaved to the free, to people that operated their own cooking schools, to women who used cooking and recipes and cookbooks um, to teach others and created their own catering businesses. So there's economic independence entangled in there. There's um, a, a value system, as I said earlier. Um, and so there were just all of these different values and characteristics that were embedded between the lines of a recipe. Mm -hmm. and, and what that showed me was that there's so much more to a cookbook um, than the instructions, depending upon your dexterity and your ability to convey that. Absolutely. Well, we will come back to modern cookbooks in a little bit. Um, Ken, I wanted to talk to you because you, you were a chef before you opened a cookbook shop. So I'm curious, what was your relationship to cookbooks prior to opening one? Um, I, you know, I kind of joke that uh, I opened up a cookbook shop with my wife, so I wouldn't have to buy another cookbook. Um, <laughs> How is and, that? <laughs> uh, it's okay. I and, and I and in the in the pregame, I, I told Matt that a quarter of my uh, personal collection comes from Kitchen Arts and Letters. And, um, yeah, and uh, and I while I haven't been up to book larder. Uh, it, 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 it remains an inspiration here on the West Coast. So, um, I mean, I remember my, my favorite um, cookbook that my mom had was the Good Housekeeping Cookbook, which was like yay thick. Um, and it was complete, everything was completely illustrated plus pictures in the middle. So as a young kid, you were kind of able to follow along. Um, this was absolutely pre-internet, pre-anything. So. Um, it, it was all analog back then. And, um, you know, we, the shop's been open for almost four years, but before that I worked for almost two decades um, as a chef, uh, mostly in fine dining. Um, uh, for uh, one of uh, Julia's biggest fans for Wolfgang Puck, um, I remember him talking about her, uh, you know, feeding her at Spago back in the day. Um, but, it was, it was really a, a thing where, I, you know, I loved food as a kid and I loved reading. And um, when I graduated college, I didn't really, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with like an English and painting degree. I mean, who, who really does? So uh, 
so I, um, I started thinking about cooking school, but I didn't have the funds to go to, I wanted to go to CIA, mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't have the funds to do that. So I decided I'm going to just start working in restaurants and just read everything that I could. So I kind of, over, I feel like I overcompensated uh, with the books and, um, and it really kind of pushed me to, um, to learn on the job and, and do, my own, uh, do my own work. Mm -hmm. Was there a book that stood out to you as a young chef? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was, um, well, back then it was uh, the Charlie Trotter books, were, which were, were kind of like um, the start of like the fancy um, modern chef's uh, coffee table book, um, mm -hmm. the French Laundry book, um, How to Become a Chef by uh, Paige and Dornberg, um, who of course wrote The Flavor of Bible, mm -hmm. and um, Probably Zuni Cafe. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. So Laura, how about you? You did not come from the food world or the book world. You were at Microsoft of all places. Yes. What made you decide to open a bookstore, a, a cookbook bookstore? Well, oh, lots of things. Um, I became sort of a cookbook lover in my late twenties. I had sort of cooked before that. Um, but um, I grew up in the Midwest. My grandmothers and my mother were much more sort of recipe card and magazine clipper sort of cooks. They didn't necessarily have cookbook collections. And, um, you know, I, I had a few cookbooks as I, as I um, moved out on my own and started cooking, but um, it wasn't until I got married and um, had registered for uh at Williams Sonoma of all places, right? Um, and put a copy of Deborah Madison's Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone on my list because my husband and I were vegetarian at the time, but I felt like I was like cooking the same brown food all the time and like I really wanted some inspiration. And I, I well, I actually, I have it right here. So it's like, you know, I get this book with like this woman who just like looks like she owns the place on the cover. And I'm like, okay, I really want to like dig into this. And, um, Besides helping me understand that I didn't actually need Bisquick to make pancakes or biscuits or anything like that, I could actually do it from scratch. Um, I really appreciated that she told her own story and had um, just this real narrative to how she thought about cooking and what it had meant sort of throughout her own life in the recipe notes. And I'd never had that experience before. And it really just kicked things off for me. And um, then I became sort of a real sort of avid collector of British cookbooks in particular. My husband's from the UK and I've, I lived there for a while in the early 90s. And so, you know, like Nigella Lawson's first book, Nigel Slater's books, um, you know, Diana Henry's books were just all ones that um, I think just helped me build confidence in the kitchen. And so like Ken, I <laughs> had this giant collection <laughs> and was like, uh, well, this is really getting out of hand. And um, I had taken the job at Microsoft in order to move to Seattle. And 15 years later, I was still there. And it was a great place, not going to knock it. But um, so when I left with this idea of doing something in food or, um, or uh, in books um, or writing, I looked at being a recipe editor. Um, I actually, um, right about that time, read Julia's book, uh, My Life in France which ended up being an absolute sort of catalyst for my life change. And I'm really not exaggerating when I say that. Um, reading this book where someone didn't really find her passion and start even cooking until she was in her late thirties, mm -hmm. the tenacity she had getting that book published and the way that she sort of launched it into her own path in food and sort of and found her own voice and her own way to contribute, I found incredibly inspiring. And so I really don't think, I mean, if I hadn't read that, maybe I would have found something else, but it was really instrumental in me deciding that, okay, maybe I don't really know much about books, but I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna open up a cookbook store. My Life in France is a good book for any late bloomers out there or people thinking that they for need- For sure. Anybody who needs to pivot, because not only right by, by Julia with her nephew, Alex Prudhomme, not only did, Julia learned how to cook when she was in her late 30s. The book didn't come out until she was, she worked on the book all through her 40s. 
didn't come out, I think, till she was like 49 or 50, right? Someone can correct me in the chat. And then she became a TV star in her 50s and then worked up until literally she passed away. I mean, and, and rem just so remarkable. Um, Laura, is that the original Deborah Madison? Was that the one, the first book you bought? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've what? re they've re uh, issued it since then with a different cover, but yeah, that was. Oh, I actually found, I can't find anything in my apartment. Tony, it, I have nothing alphabetized. So I was like, where the heck is Tony's book? And I forgot the spine is red. I thought it was a white <laughs> spine. So I was like hunting for this white spine. But I found the very first cookbook I ever bought. I was in college um, and it's Kathleen's Bake Shop. So if anybody knows Tate's Bake, it eventually became Tate's Bake Shop. And it has the, you know, it's, it's falling yeah. apart basically. But, um, you know, no pictures, just some really solid baked good recipes, but I've never been able to part with this. I thought that might be a fun question for the folks uh, following along. If you wanna put in the chat, if you remember what the first cookbook is that you ever bought, we'd love to know what everybody's first cookbook was. All right, so Laura, that was your transition from Microsoft into cookbooks. Ken, I, Matt, I did not know you were an editor at Penguin. I've known you all these years and I had absolutely no idea. Well, that's what brought me to New York. Uh, I grew up in Oregon mm -hmm. and uh, I came to New York uh, with stars in my eyes and dreaming that I would find and publish all the great uh, American books. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, publishing was mostly fighting about marketing budgets and didn't have so much to do with getting books into people's hands. Mm -hmm. And then I quit my job and there was this opening at a bookstore a couple of days a week. And it was about food, which was a great area for me because I was really interested. And I sort of started here and it just sort of blossomed. So um, I will have been here 30 years this year. Um, so it's been a long time. Uh, but uh, I just sort of like being immersed here. And uh, yes, it's very good for me to have the store because uh, uh, I could probably not fit all the books I wanna have at home <laughs> in, in the amount of space that I would be allowed to have at home for books. So I, I'm here amidst them six days a week and that's, that's the good, good compromise. Well, um, Matt, how long did you last at Penguin? I was there six years. Oh, okay. So you were there for a while. Yeah. yeah. It was, I mean, it was just, I wasn't doing any food books there. Food was a refuge for me. It was the thing that I did when I left work. Yeah. Uh, I catered some of the office parties. I did a little private work as a caterer, but um, I didn't edit any food books in my time. Um, did you ever cross paths with Judith Jones while you were there? I'm not, 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 not while I was in publishing. Okay. I mean, I, you know, at parties and things like that, once uh, I was working here, uh, she and Knock Waxman, who founded this bookstore, uh, were very good friends. Uh, and they, you know, so they would often uh, be in touch or Judith would call the store or something like that. So I spoke to her more than I ever saw her. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, have you been tempted to open a bookstore? Yes. <laughs> 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 on more than one occasion, but I have uh, my friends here as a reminder that, you know, stay in your lane. I, um, I'm not even really a collector. Um, I've been a reluctant collector. I was on a mission to prove a point. Um, and the books that I collect are so darn expensive um, that the idea of me really being an avid collector, I'm fortunate that um, the bibliography that I used in order to hunt these books down as my shopping list, mm -hmm. um, I have exhausted it. So thankfully, wow. I now have um, in first edition, um, with maybe one or two exceptions, all of the books listed um, wow. on this bibliography wow. that was published by the um, University of Alabama. With a little help from my friends in book selling, right? Mm -hmm. um, that 1827 book, there's such a terrific story with that. Um, um, I was in New York um, and I called Bonnie Slotnick and said, I'm in town. Do you have anything, you know, I don't have? And she was like, everybody knows you have everything already. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing anybody could sell you. And I said, well, I am looking for first editions, right? I had, um, as we were talking about collecting, um, what's your first cookbook? I had a lot of these books in reprint, um, those Applewood things. 
but um, I wanted the first editions and didn't understand that I was building a rare collection and a library. I was just thinking I wanted the most authentic, as Matt talked about earlier, you know, the, the earliest edition I could get before anybody had tampered perhaps with it. Wow. Um, I, and so she sent somebody, she said, I know somebody that's got a copy of that. And lo and behold, this person um, thought that the cause that I was in pursuit of was valid and valuable and sold me the book. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I read, I remember reading in the Jemima Code that you said you, you spent a small fortune on cookbooks and now I know why it was a small fortune. Yes. Uh, it was a small fortune. And um, when the Abby Fisher book uh, from 1881 became available, um, that is the book that we originally thought was the first official cookbook. Wow. Uh, she was a formerly enslaved woman. And because of my Southern California roots, I initially was going through that list, trying to find every book that had a California connection. Mm -hmm. um, and so Abby's story um, is that she left the South um, when she was uh, liberated and started a manufacturing company in the Bay Area, which again speaks to her entrepreneurship and her brilliance and all of that. Anyway, I wanted that book. And um, so Celia had it at Omnivore in San Francisco. And I lost that book um, to someone else uh, in the process of the sale and uh, never got over it. And um, so when it became available at auction recent, in recent years, everybody encouraged me to put up a GoFundMe campaign yeah. for it. And that's felt really um, dirty to me that, you know, GoFundMe is for people that had family concerns and funerary issues. Mm -hmm. And I just, as a journalist, I, you know, just couldn't, I, I could not um, fathom taking anything. Um, but people were adamant and we raised $10,000 in 10 days wow. Wow. for the purchase of that book. Amazing. Um, this doesn't really have to do with cookbooks, but there's a, a wonderful new website called Abby and Edna by these two young women um, in tribute to Abby and Edna Lewis. Oh, how about that? Yeah, I'll have to send you the link after this, but, uh, but folks should definitely check that out. Um, uh, that's a remarkable story. Is there, are there any holy grails left? Are there any books you're still on the hunt for? Um, the only other one that I don't have that we're not sure there is another copy um, is from 1866. Um, and it was written by Melinda Russell. She was a, a free woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, and what's compelling to me about her is that she was a single mother mm -hmm. uh, with a challenged child. So again, when I think about the values that are conveyed in a cookbook, here is a woman who was raising money um, for her livelihood. Wow. And she observed that as a way out of poverty uh, in the broader community. And she engaged white women to help her with this. So we're still quibbling over whether food is a unifier or you know, a, a divider. Um, but at least in that case and several others in my collection, the women came together on behalf of one another. And um, so I'm, I would love to have the Melinda Russell um, original. Um, what I do have are the last five or six copies of the facsimile that was uh, published by the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent them to me to have in the collection um, so that I would have them. Wow. Um, and then I don't know if they'll reprint, reprint them or not. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's amazing. Have you given thought to what you'll do with this collection eventually? I interviewed uh, Ann Willen yesterday, who some folks will know, um, who's a, a historian, writer. She's authored over 30 cookbooks. Um, and I think uh, her husband's collection was donated to the Getty, I believe she told me. Um, yeah, I'm having those conversations uh, where, you know, I have um, touch, uh, different universities and institutions have touched this process for me. As I said, if it wasn't for the University of Texas, there would have been no Jemima Code um, because when the publishing industry said no to me as they said no to Julia, um, UT Press came through. And um, so um, they're close and near and dear to my heart. Um, so there are several others. Smithsonian is obviously high on my list. Um, I've grown a little concerned about having them stored as I have them. I don't want them in my own personal possession because of their value. It's, I think that's a little dangerous. Um, and so I have them in a, you know, they're offsite and 
um, but they're not being cared for uh, in the proper way that an archivist would. So I am having serious um, thoughts about where to donate at least the most um, rare mm -hmm. of them uh, in my wow. name in some way. Well, that's an absolute treasure. I mean, what, what a remarkable collection you put together. Um, but again, in the meantime, if folks want to know more about it, they should definitely check out the Jemima Code. Um, Ken, Laura, and Matt, I, I want to talk about 2020 and how your bookstores did in the year 2020. I mean, I've, I started out working in bookstores back in high school and college. Um, folks out there might remember Spring Street Books and Soho. I worked there for years um, and, and really saw a lot of ups and downs in the, the bookstore world. Um, that was the time when Barnes and Noble was opening everywhere and, and independent bookstores were closing all over the place. And um, I never thought we'd see a renaissance for independent bookstores. So I am so heartened by what has happened and, and so grateful for the three of you um, for what you have built and, and the communities you have built up around your shops. Um, but I'm curious how, how things were in 2020 and what was selling and who was coming to you to buy books. Um, Ken, why don't we start with you? What, what went down in LA last year? What were people looking for? Um, I mean, there was the, uh, you know, the obvious thing about, the, about sourdough that people were, were into for about a couple months and then they realized how hard it was. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, just make focaccia people, come on. Uh, but um, so that, that was part of the, the gambit there, there was a lot of interest in fermentation and um, uh, like canning, um, preserving food. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when, when the murder of George Floyd happened mm -hmm. in June, as Tony can tell you, like anything that had to do with the African-American experience in food um, for us, it was, we could not keep a single copy of Jubilee or Jemima Code in stock. Um, um, for, and this was like the vibration cooking was, was unattained. We couldn't get any, any of those books, um, which was fantastic. And it was thrilling, but it was also educational for us too, because it was a big, it was a really big message to, to myself and Michelle and the team here that we have, you know, it's about representation and you know, we, a lot of these, I would say 70% of the books that we do carry in our, um, you know, Amplify Black Voices collection now, we didn't carry until last year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, we know we have to do better. And that was a big, that was a big point as far as um, moving on from 2020 is who do we want to represent on the shelf and, and on the table here. Mm -hmm. Laura, did you similarly look at your mix last year? Yeah, I mean, it was in terms of what people were buying, I think it's it really just echoes what what Ken mentioned. Um, and I would say as a business, the most challenging thing was just making this pivot from selling to people in person, right? Someone walks in your store, you help them choose something, they buy it, they walk out the door. Um, you miss that personal interaction in the early days, but also just making that switch to um, trying to do all of that online, which is a much more labor intensive way of doing it and that I am incredibly grateful for. But at the same time, it was just this really big shift where we went from like, you know, being this very like hands-on interactive sort of place to gather to like turning the whole place into like, a mini shipping station sort of warehouse. Um, and so it really, you know, it took a lot of creativity from all of us to, to really figure that out and put processes in place and buy all the supplies and all those kinds of things. But it, and that also, you know, has led us to talk about the impact that all of that is having on the environment and reevaluate the packaging that we're using and the, books that were returning, you know, that are damaged that we would have, you know, or books that we're now selling for lower prices that are damaged that we would have normally sent back to the publishers and, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, Ken 
absolutely. Those are totally the same titles that we were selling and we've kind of all been through this big shift. Um, so I'm looking forward to being able to do things more in person again, but quite honestly, I think that it also opened up a lot of opportunities and showed us ways that we can reach um, authors and readers and attendees at events like this that we weren't doing in the past. And so, um, so it's been hard, but it also um, showed us a lot as well. Yeah. Matt, how about for you? I mean, Kitchen Arts and Letters is a, is a New York City institution and people, people would visit, tourists would go visit you just to see your bookstore and buy some books from you. How did last year impact your business? Well, I mean, the initial part of last year was uh, an absolute disaster. I mean, uh, like a lot of small businesses, I, we weren't alone in that. We were forced to be closed. We pretty much lost uh, 85, 90% of our revenue. Um, and uh, it put us in a really bad position. Uh, we started to be able to have people back in the store over the summer, but it wasn't getting better. And um, we made a pretty difficult decision to go to GoFundMe to look for support. Um, uh, like Tony said, I sort of felt like that was something for people whose uh, whose needs were uh, were deeper than ours. But on the other hand, I just maxed out my fourth credit card and mm -hmm. I knew that we weren't gonna be able to get it through the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And we asked for help and it was, um, it was really touching how, uh, how it poured in. We, soared past our goal in four days. Wow. Um, it was just amazing. And there was, con there were contributions from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, like 1200 people stepped up for us. It was, um, uh, it was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So it reminded us that we really had a job to do here that was greater than just um, keeping the door open. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been looking very hard um, like Ken said, uh, uh, making sure that we are always uh, helping push the envelope about mm -hmm. what gets represented. Publishers have to be led. Um, oh. and occasionally they'll do something uh, surprising on their own, but they have to really be given all the possible encouragement to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, we've been you know, investing money in ordering lots of copies of books that, uh, that sort of a publisher might have taken on a felt like they were taking a long shot on and if we step up and we order you know 50 or 100 copies which is a big order for us um we're trying to send the message to the publisher to keep doing that kind of thing and most of the time i mean they don't all succeed but they succeed often enough that mm -hmm. we're trying to help push the boundaries a little bit mm -hmm. um but we uh we've always felt here that um, and this has been especially true since the internet came along, recipes fall from the sky. Recipes are everywhere. You can find them online for free. So when you're putting out money for a book, you want more than just recipes. You mm -hmm. want a story. And as Tony said, you want to be connected to, you want the insight into who the person is who's telling you that story. What are they offering you? Are they taking you seriously? I mean, I think that's why Julia succeeded so well and has for so long is that she really takes her interest in French cooking seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just want to make French food for dinner once a month, there's no point in buying Mastering the Art of French Cooking. But if you want to really understand the French culture of food, it's a magnificent pathway into that. And so we're always looking for the books that, uh, that offer a, a richer, deeper level. And um, and trying to encourage the possibility that more of them will be published. Mm -hmm. Do you, do the publishers talk to you three? Laura, do you ever hear from cookbook publishers? I do for sure, yeah. Especially yeah. our local ones. Um, I have great relationships with the editors at Sasquatch and Mountaineers and places like that, but yeah, for sure. Um, Ken, how about you, do you hear from them? Um, yeah, I guess they're starting, they're starting to say hello. And uh, uh, I mean, when we when I when we opened up the shop, uh, you know, I had this like closed minded idea of, well, if I open up a cookbook store because here in L.A. because it's it, 
the last cookbook store was Cook's Library, which closed in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, if I could get just get the chefs and the restaurant people on board, then we would be okay. But once we opened, we realized that the people who love bo uh, bookstores are the people who love books. They're, they're readers. Um, you know, people would come in and, and show, show pictures of their cookbook collection right next to their pictures of their kids. Wow. So um, yeah, it was, it was really gratifying. And I, and I do want to add that um, the big part about 2020 as well is not only did people, I think a, a whole generation of people are learned how to cook at home mm -hmm. was that they also learned that they wanted to support uh, local small businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gary, um, if I could add something there, um, you know, as we're talking about indie bookstores, mm -hmm. um, you know, my voice was a um, disruptor of the food world uh, and the food industry's perception of itself. Um, and the only reason that my work has succeeded is because of, among the reasons, is indie bookstores mm -hmm. uh, like these here. Um, the events that they held for me, um, there was a line outside of the door um, at Ken's place waiting to get in on his say-so, right? So these are, this was at the beginning of my book tour when people hadn't really been um, public, you know, talking about Jubilee as much yet. Um, so they do build an incredible community, not just within their consumer base, but also with us as the authors. Um, and the support that they extend is so um, um, meaningful. Um, I don't think that, well, I can tell you for sure, um, I would have had to write the Jemima Code um, in a totally different voice and manner if I were thinking that it was going to go into the big box stores. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I would be dismissed automatically by them. So my motive in selling it and crafting its messaging um, all the way through how it was marketed, we, all, we knew all along that um, it wouldn't appeal at that level. But indie bookstores um, embraced that work day after week after month. Um, and that just paved the way for Jubilee to come in um, with the next level of the messaging. And, and so we've been able to layer on the story by developing trust you know, with the readers um, who, who know that I'm going to tell um, a, a truth without it um, coming uh, with a hammer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that helps, I think, um, us all um, as we try to get more readers, get more people involved in, in, in reading books. Matt, are you worried about the impact of social media and celebrity on who gets to write a cookbook these days? I mean, there there have always been celebrities writing cookbooks. I mean, you know, uh, and there will always be famous people stepping into areas where they have no particular expertise and deciding to swan around and, and say that they're wonderful. So I don't worry about that because at the same time, we keep finding all these amazing gems that people self-publish or they push forward or that like Tony did, they go with a small press that's willing to give them some room and and put some faith in them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always possible. Um, I think for us, it's become easier to get the word out that we have something extraordinary mm -hmm. than in the old days when we uh, would do a printed mailer three times a year to tell people about you know what had come in, and we had to make sure that we could only you know we could only fit so many things in there, and you know it was it was very much of a different time. And now we can we can help support authors a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hearing more from, from authors who are self-publishing. And I will say this to anybody out there, whether you're self-publishing or whether you're publishing with one of the biggest companies in the world, reach out to us. Your publicists have a lot on their plate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatever you can do for yourself is best. Email all of these stores and let them know that you're out there. Don't assume that your publisher is doing that work for you. Yeah, same same with the magazine. I mean, I can say that you know we sometimes we'll see a book when it's in one of your bookstores, or we see it on Instagram, and I'll be like, "How in the world did we not know that book was coming out?" But um, it's hard to stay on top of everything. So if there are any authors out there, just know that 
Ken, you're, you're nodding. Do you hear from any authors? Well, you know, because, you know, we've only been around since the fall of 2017 mm -hmm. um, and having, literally having, I mean, I worked right after college, I worked uh, for two years as a bookseller and book receiver in St. Louis at uh, a place called Library Limited, which was amazing. Um, uh, but really no experience in publishing or, or, or the book world or anything like that. We just loved cookbooks. So um, we used, the, for us, the benefit of social media was reaching out directly to these authors and writers and saying, hey, do you wanna do a, a, a book talk? Do, are you gonna be in LA? Um, can you send us book plates? Um, so it was that one-on-one -on -one thing that Matt had, had really kind of uh, talked about where you, we just go straight to the stores. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Tony, when you were talking about the, your book event here, uh, I have to say that one of my favorite memories of you is at the end of the, at the, end of the, the talk, we were bringing out all the books for you to sign. And this was a week after pub day. And you said, we had all these stacks of books and you, you, you basically said, are you sure you want me to sign all these? <laughs> implying, implying maybe you want to return some of these <laughs> or like it was a big, it, it, was a, it, it was a big gamble. And I think what, uh, what Matt and, and, and Laura can attest to is that you just, sometimes you just believe in a, in a book and in a, in a, in a title. Oh. That's beautiful, Ken. Well, thank you for doing that for Tony. Oh. Laura, I want to ask you, you know, the, the pace of change in the publishing world and, and Matt, you worked in publishing, so you can talk about this. It takes so long for a cookbook to go from idea to your bookstore. Um, are you frustrated at the pace of change among the mainstream publishers or are you, have you seen progress? I've seen progress. Um, I think and by progress, I mean, who's getting published these days? Oh yeah. So, um, so there's definitely been progress. I mean, I've had my shop for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in that time it is definitely, um, you know, your, the representation has definitely improved, but it's nowhere near what it needs to be in terms of, um, different cultural voices, um, black authors, AAPI authors, but also um, I think um, one of the things I've been encouraged by this year, but that I think we still need to see more of are also queer authors mm -hmm. um, and queer authors who are allowed in publishing to uh, sort of represent the fact that they um, wanna see themselves in books. Uh, we had a great conversation with Rebecca Pepler last night about her new book, Atab, and, um, seeing you know a major publisher get behind a woman basically only having photos of women in her book queer women um you know and and really getting to use that gaze um is great and seeing um more and more authors like julia tertian and zoe Jonio and people um you know ruby tando who in their writing are embracing the fact that um you know, there's more to them than just what they cook is, I love that. And so I want to see more of that. I want to see more authors who aren't white get to tell stories about things other than just their culture, which I think is, you know, people have, people represent multitudes, they have a lot to say. So mm -hmm. I would like to see publishing move a little faster on those fronts. I think they're making progress. I think they're taking things seriously, but um, there's a lot of, a lot of room to grow. Okay. We are running out of time. I would love to know from each of you a book that you are championing right now. And I loved, I loved that that spirit that you talked about. How, you know, when a bookseller gets behind a book, they can help find an audience for that book. So I would love to know what is a book that you are super enthusiastic about right now that you're trying to find an, an audience for. I will you answer. I'm going to scan the Q and A box because I do want to take a few questions from the audience. So if you have a burning question and you did not put it in the Q and A box yet, drop it in there. Um, Tony, why don't we start with you? I know you're not a bookseller, but you do get to see a lot of books. I'm sure in your capacity as an editor in chief, um, is there a book that you are particularly passionate about right now that you can recommend to the audience? Um, that is such a dangerous uh, spot for me to be in, like choosing one of your favorite children. 
um, because so many of my friends, uh, African American and other, are getting published. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is there is a big stack now of uh, voices that we have not been listening to or heard from as often. Mm -hmm. And so seek out those culinary voices of color or that are uh, BIPOC so that you know, there, there will be more of them published. But I've been uh, unable to do any blurbs in the last year or so and in, endorsing is too close to heart. Okay, okay. Matt, how about you? What, what's a book you're championing right now? Well, I mean, I'm always, uh, <laughs> I'm always bad at these kinds of questions because of course that's the moment somebody asks me that my, my mind goes blank. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna cast my mind back a little bit. Um, I was beyond excited about two years ago when Julia Tertian came into the store and started asking for all our books about East Africa um, mm -hmm. because for years I, I had been trying to find books for people about that. So in Bibi's Kitchen, which uh, Julia helped Hawass Hassan write, which profiles uh, women from eight East African countries is um, such a step forward for the way in which publishers think about, uh, about the food of the world and how it can be connected and how it can be rich. And they've done this amazing job of telling the stories of, of cooks, some of whom are still cooking in these countries, some of whom are cooking away from there, either because of political turmoil or uh, economic opportunity, but it gives you a sense of a, of a cultural and food history that I think most Americans are not aware of at all. And that was a book that really made me feel like, yes, occasionally the big houses can really get it right. Mm -hmm. Great. Ken, how about you? Um, a book that really comes to mind immediately this year is uh, um, Mr. Jews in Chinatown uh, by Brandon Jew and Ken Lon Ho. Um, it, really, there, it really is about this like interplay between Brandon's story, uh, Ch the Chinatown in San Francisco, which is the oldest Chinatown in the country, uh, and being Chinese American. Uh, and it's just quite moving interplay between those three points um, uh, that it's that it almost like Brandon's stunning food and, and the photography, which is, it, the book is um, produced by an all um, Chinese American cast. Um, the, it, it's almost like the food is, is like the bonus part of that book because mm -hmm. of, of the moving points of history of Chinatown and, and Brandon's story. Mm -hmm. Laura? Um, I'm very excited about Mariana Velasquez's uh, book coming out about uh, oh, Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, really excited about that. It's, it's always so encouraging to see um, countries whose cuisines aren't represented in English get like the big glossy cookbook treatment and sort of move out of that pamphlet stage of, um, of cookbooks. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a that's a beautiful one. Uh, Mariana Velasquez did. Um, it's called Colombiana, and it's out in June. She's a really talented food stylist. We just did a, a demo with her the other day, and she uh, shared a little bit of news with the audience. She was also the food stylist on In the Heights, the Lin Manuel Miranda oh. movie that's coming out in oh. June. So June is going to be a very big month for uh, for her. So we're all very excited for her. Okay. Let's take a few audience questions. Um, our friend Abina, who always has questions for us, would like to know um, some tips for someone who wants to write a cookbook. Tony, why don't we start with you? We'll, we'll, we'll have you answer that question. Aspiring cookbook writer. Um, I think in this day and age, you can be your true self. That's the, the biggest take home message here. Um, there was a time when publishers and gatekeepers uh, massaged our voices and controlled uh, what we could say or, you know, forced us to redirect some of our passion. Um, mm -hmm. But today you can find your voice, um, you can share your voice, and people are interested to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the biggest um, surprises for me was being able to find my tribe um, in social media. So stick with your voice. Um, because people, re it resonates, right? People can tell when you're, when you're being honest or when you're just trying to sell a book. Okay. Um, Matt, this might be one for you. Uh, 
where can someone get their collection appraised? Well, it all depends on, on precisely what you want it appraised for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, cookbooks don't have, except, you know, Tony can tell you some different stories, but I mean, in the most cases, cookbooks don't have incredible values uh, the way that, say, first editions of mystery novels or so forth might. Um, so uh, it can be a big job for someone to do a thorough work for you, but I would, um, first of all, don't like pack everything up, just take photographs of the spines. That's mm -hmm. often enough for uh, someone to do that for you. We get approached enough that we're really not able to do a full appraisals for people any longer, uh, except in the most extraordinary circumstances. But uh, you can probably get a pretty good take from, from your local indie bookstore. I mean, I think all of us here would love to get the support from everybody who's participating in this panel, but you can also, you know, if there's a local bookstore near you, God, they need you. And please, that's an important takeaway is just go to them. They can help you if you can help them. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, Sherry, uh, people are saying cookbooks are a dying breed. How do you reply to that, Ken? <laughs> dying breed, uh, I mean, if we, we're still around, so I mean, <laughs> We, we opened, you know, we're the, we're the new kid on the block here. So I think we're, we're doing okay. I mean, the online business is the pivot as, as uh, everybody here can att attest to it's, it was really like opening a brand new business. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, we're shipping books to Singapore or to Ireland or, um, you know, to, to Venezuela. So I think, um, I don't think the cookbook is gonna go away. Mm -hmm. Thank God. So. <laughs> Laura, what's your answer to that? Oh, very similar. I mean, um, cookbooks and children's books continue to be the, the growth areas in publishing overall. And, um, you know, there's just the internet is great for finding, you know, a specific recipe, but there is nothing like a collective voice in a book that you can touch and look at the pictures or read. Um, so I, uh, yeah, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> and then our last question from Pascal. Pascal is, I believe, a cookbook author. Um, Matt, you mentioned authors reaching out to folks. What's the best way for an author to get in touch with all of you? You can write to me at matt at kitchenartsandletters.com. That comes yeah. to my phone. Um, I would be is happy your, to- Is that on your website, your Matt? And to the website, but I mean, the, the mat at kitchenartsandletters.com comes to me rather than the general inbox. Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't implying you had to give your emails to the whole world, but um, <laughs> Laura, <It's... laughs> Laura and Ken, how about you? How's the best way for a book, uh, uh, an author to reach out to you? Um, probably quickest is uh, a message on Instagram at now serving LA. Okay. Or, uh, uh, our general email, hello at Nasser. Like okay, so people can slide into your DMs, Ken. That's totally cool. We answer them all the time. Okay, okay, good. Laura? So um, they can either email me directly, Laura at booklearder.com or info at booklearder.com because the store manager will be more likely to see that and she um, helps me with those decisions. So yeah. All right. And Tony, if, a, if an author wants to pitch you for a story, what's the best way to reach you or to get your attention? Uh, you mean for America's Test Kitchen Cooks Country? Uh, they can uh, email me at tony.tiptonmartin at America's Test Kitchen. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you for being so so generous with your information. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. I'm so sorry Francis wasn't here and I am I hope I did okay filling in last minute. Um, and I just, I, I adore all of you and I, I I don't know, we get asked often, you know, cause we have a magazine, which is somewhere, I'm looking for my own magazine. Um, you know, people always ask us, you know, is print dead? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, civil <laughs> civilization is dead when print is dead. And I just, I know how hard it is to run a bookstore and Tony to just collect on the level that you have and to put out the beautiful books that you have. I know how hard that is. And just from, from the hundreds of people who have joined us on this talk, Thank you to you four for what you do. It's um, it's invaluable, and and I I don't know just to 
I'm sure a lot of you have similar stories, but growing up as a, as a young kid, I feel like books saved my life. And if it wasn't for the library um, and all those beautiful books and the wonderful librarians, I don't know, you know, who knows what that did for me in my path, but um, I think it set me on a very good path. So just sending all my love to you. And I, you know, I hope, I hope times become easier for booksellers and everybody out there, like Matt said, support your local booksellers. Um, all right, I wanted to uh, just say, speaking of magazines, this is our magazine. Matt, thank you for having magazines behind you. Uh, <laughs> I know all three of you carry our magazines. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is our special Julia Child edition, which has been, was such a, a, just an amazing experience putting it together. And I appreciate the support that all of you have shown us with that issue. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors again, uh, Carrie Gold, Crate and Barrel, Oh my God, I'm gonna, I, I was not prepared to moderate today as you all know. Um, so, okay, Kerrygold, Crate and Barrel, Whole Foods Market, um, Co-Brand Fine Wine and Spirits, Sam Pellegrino and Le Creuset. Again, thank you for making all of this programming free. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and we have one more event tomorrow celebrating Julia. We'll be talking about Julia Child's legacy and uh, I can't wait to wrap things up. And I just wanna thank the four of you for your time. So. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. It was great. It was great. Thank you. Bye, oh, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye.